Good afternoon. Mine and unmuted. Good afternoon, and thanks so much for joining in. Earlier this week, we announced our state's plan for the very first doses of COVID-19 vaccine. We're slated to receive our first shipments of the vaccine as early as next week after the vaccine grant gains FDA emergency use authorization. We expect to receive 9,750 doses of the Pfizer vaccine through the state's allocation, which will be delivered to 10 of Montana's major hospitals in the seven largest communities. Those first in line to receive these initial doses will be Montana's healthcare workers, who've served tirelessly for nine months to care for the people of this state under very trying circumstances. And in the coming rounds, that will also include the Moderna vaccine, likely a week later, pending FDA approval, We'll be targeting healthcare workers in our more rural areas, as well as healthcare personnel and residents in skilled nursing facilities. These are the healthcare workers who put their own health at risk while on the job, or they may have had to temporarily isolate or quarantine due to the risk that the job poses. By prioritizing the vaccination of those on the front lines, we can help ensure that our hospitals have the staff to continue serving patients while we wait for the widespread distribution of the vaccines. As we enter the initial uh, stages of vaccine distribution and administration, this is certainly encouraging news after some long and dark, challenging months here in Montana and around our country. We're also seeing some encouraging news with a decline in the daily rate of new positive cases and a decline in COVID-19 hospitalizations in Montana. On November 20th, we put in place some new restrictions and we emphasized the importance of masking up by applying that requirement to wear a mask in public places to all 56 counties without regard to uh, the number of positive cases in those counties. In the two weeks since its implementation, case counts across Montana, they have started to decline. In some of the larger counties, a similar trend is apparent. Case counts in Yellowstone County have de decreased by 36% and in Gallatin County by 38% since November 20th. This is good news and it demonstrates what other states and other counties have certainly found. Wearing a mask and limiting gatherings and gathering sizes works to prevent the spread of COVID-19. Of note, new positive cases have started to decline while testing has remained steady. The number of laboratory tests conducted in Montana increased during the month of September, held steady at around 35,000 weekly lab tests in October. In November, on average, nearly 37,000 samples were tested weekly in our state. The highest positivity rates occurred in mid-November, but it began to decline continuously since then. The total positivity rate in November was close to 20%. It's now dropped to around 14%. The average number of tests conducted has remained steady. That means fewer new COVID-19 cases were diagnosed during the two most recent weeks. Hospital beds occupied by COVID-19 patients has steadily increased since mid-October to a high occupancy in mid-November. Average COVID-19 bed occupancy fluctuated slightly in the last two weeks of November. By early December, the number of patients in the hospital has dropped. We're in the process of reconciling hospital bed data with some of the local jurisdictions. And as we do, we anticipate we'll see further declines in the numbers of hospitalizations. So we are seeing signs that give us some optimism. Looking at this data, it appears that Montanans are stepping up taking the steps needed to mitigate the spread of this virus here in our state. They're concerned when they see our hospitals overwhelmed 
and schools and businesses struggling to stay open. The control measures we have in place and the statewide mask requirement, they do make a difference. And they will make a greater difference if they're closely followed by all Montanans. Additionally, there are now 284 medical staff from around the country serving at our hospitals across our state through the state's contract with New West. This additional staffing, coupled with the decline we're seeing in hospitalization numbers, is providing a slight reprieve. After a period of time when many of our hospitals were at, nearing or exceeding capacity, and we're facing significant workforce shortages in the healthcare workforce. But we can't let our guard down now. Not now and not in the coming months, as we inch closer to reaching that light at the end of what is a long tunnel. Together as Montanans, uh, we are at a crossroads in how we choose to manage this virus through to the widespread administration of vaccines. We can work vigilantly to continue the trend of decreasing numbers in new positive cases. And to do so, is to adhere to basic preventative measures, wearing a face covering in public places, social distancing, avoiding crowds and gatherings, and practicing good hygiene. And in choosing this path, we can save lives. We can prevent our hospitals from being overrun. We can show our doctors and nurses and healthcare providers that we truly appreciate that they haven't given up the fight through it all, and neither should we. The alternative path is certainly to let our guard down. Doing so would cause more death. It would cause more harm to our schools and Main Street businesses. that are at a greater risk of closing their doors when we see uncontrollable community spread. And hospitals could have too many people in need, but not enough beds or medical staff to provide care. I believe that Montana can be a state that makes it through this pandemic without having to turn away patients at our hospitals. That choice though, it is in our hands. And I remain hopeful that most Montanans are taking this virus seriously, along with their responsibility to protect their neighbors and their friends. It's now my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker for today, who's here visiting Montana, and particularly he will be visiting testing efforts on the Fort Peck uh, Reservation. Vice Admiral Jerome Adams is the 20th Surgeon General of the United States. As Surgeon General, he oversees the operations of the U.S. Public Health Service Commission Corps, which has more than 6,000 uniformed health officers who serve to promote, protect, and advance the health and safety of our nation. Dr. Adams is also a member of the President's Coronavirus Task Force. Now turn it over to Dr. Adams. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much, Governor, for having me here today. I just want to start off by saying to the people of Montana, thank you. Thank you because I know every time you turn on the TV, it's doom and gloom. Thank you because I know that we're always talking about and you're always hearing about people who aren't doing the things that we know will slow the spread of the virus. But here are the facts. <clears throat> the facts are more people than ever are wearing face coverings. The facts are more people than ever are sacrificing and really keeping their gatherings small. But the fact also is this virus is incredibly, incredibly unforgiving. It is incredibly contagious, and we all need to do our part to slow the spread, save lives, and keep places open or reopen places as appropriate. Now, one of the questions I get all day is, why did you come to Montana, Surgeon General? Well, as the governor mentioned, I am the head of the United States Public Health Service Commission Corps, and about a third of our officers 
serve in Indian Health Services facilities. And uh, I'm going to be visiting Fort Peck tomorrow to open up a surge testing site. And I want to highlight to you that this pandemic has hit us all hard, but it's hit some communities particularly hard. The percentage of Native Americans in Montana is about 7%. The number of cases is closer to about 19 or 20 percent. And the number of deaths in Montana is about 30 percent in terms of Native Americans. This is unacceptable, but it shows how this virus has preyed on people who have not just pre existing medical conditions, but pre existing social conditions that conspire to reduce our resilience, our opportunity, and our health. Now there's another reason I came here, and it's because President Trump, Vice President Pence, Dr. Birx, and the task force wanted me to come here and highlight the fact that we are in a precarious time. We have seen record cases for nine weeks in a row. We are seeing those turn into record hospitalizations and yesterday we had our deadliest day ever due to this virus. It is a precarious time and we should all be appropriately concerned. Uh, but as the governor mentioned, uh, I want you to know that Montana has proven that these mitigation efforts work. You have successfully, in the midst of cases going up around the country, been able to decrease your positivity rates. So I want you to understand the science, the public health is evolving day by day, but we know more than we ever have before about this virus. And we know statistically that your efforts are working to slow the spread. It's interesting I'm here today because the FDA Verb Pack Committee is meeting to evaluate Pfizer's vaccine. While uh, we should be concerned and that should lead to caution, we should also be confident. We should be confident because unlike the prior surges in this country where you rightfully asked, how long is this going to be for? When is it going to end? We now have a finish line in sight. By this time next week, I feel confident we will be vaccinating people. So running a marathon is incredibly hard. And the hardest part of the marathon is always the last couple of miles. But you get the strength to keep going when you know the finish line is just around the turn. I want the people of Montana to know the finish line is just around the turn with a safe and a highly effective vaccine. We would have been happy if we had a vaccine that was 50 or 60 percent effective. These vaccines are over 90 percent effective. So we truly have the capability to drive this virus into the ground once we start getting people vaccinated. But even though you know the Calvary's coming, that doesn't mean you just open up the gates and lay down and let the enemy attack you. That means you have to keep your guard up. You have to keep defending the fort until the Calvary arrives. And we need you to continue to do your part. We need you to wash your hands. We need you to Watch your distances, meaning stay six feet from others and avoid crowded indoor spaces. Keep household gatherings small and try to avoid interactions with people outside of your household. And we need you to understand the importance of wearing face masks. I know there's debate about mandates. I know that Montanans are proud to be independent. You make up your own minds. And I grew up on a farm. I grew up in the country. I know what it's like to have no one else but yourself to depend on and uh, to really not want other people telling you what to do. Here's what I'll say to you. Masks work. And beginning back in February and March, we did not know the number of people who would be spreading this virus asymptomatically. Put another way, if the governor and I, one of us had a cold, You'd know it. We'd have watery eyes, runny nose, a cough. We'd look bad. And we would know to stay away from one another. We'd know to stay home. 
That's the way respiratory viruses typically work. If someone is sick, you know it, and you either stay home if you're sick, or those are the people who we traditionally told to wear a mask. That is why originally we didn't recommend that everyone wear a mask. What we have found out over the course of this past year is that over 50% of the people spreading this virus look and feel just fine. They're what we call asymptomatic. And though the virus is small, the droplets that transmit the virus that come out of our mouth and our nose when we speak, sing, yell, and sneeze are large enough to be captured by most face coverings. And that is why we now recommend that everyone wear a face covering when you're out around people outside of your household. Because if you lock those droplets, it can decrease your chance of spreading the virus to others. And guess what? It can also be a protective barrier that prevents other people's droplets from landing on your mouth and on your nose. That is the science behind face masks. The data, the data now shows that communities where you had higher levels of face mask wearing actually had lower disease spread and they were able to keep more places open and they had slower or had, had a smaller surges for shorter periods of time. Europe had their third surge a few, uh, few weeks before we did. Their surge ended in about five weeks. They hit their peak and it started to come back down. And that is because they aggressively wore face masks and watched their distances. We're in now week nine of our surge in the United States. Again, I want you to understand that even if you don't feel personally at risk for the virus, uh, there are important reasons for you to wear a mask. And one of them is that by wearing one voluntarily, you will shorten the amount of time that schools are closed, that businesses are closed, that restaurants are closed, and you will hasten the time that it takes for us to get back to a greater sense of normal. Again, I also want to reiterate that this is not forever. If we can get everyone vaccinated, then we can put this pandemic behind us. So we need you to hang on and do this just a little bit longer. Wear a face mask because it helps you from a health perspective and from an economic perspective. I want you to know another thing that's very troubling to me, and the governor alluded to this. I sat on a hospital capacity call this morning. Multiple hospitals across the state reported being at 100% capacity. Do you know what that means? That means if you aren't scared of the virus, you still may not be able to get a hospital bed if you have a heart attack, if you're in labor, if you get into a car accident, because there may not be a bed available. And the governor in your state agencies and the federal government are doing everything we can to preserve that capacity. But what's also different about this current surge is that in the first two surges, the first one hit New York, the second one hit the Southwest, they were regional. And we were able to pull resources from one place, whether it's healthcare workers or personal protective equipment or tests or what have you, and move it to another place. We can't do that during this surge because everyone is being hit all at once. So wear a mask for your healthcare workers. Wear a mask to protect those people who are out there fighting to protect you. Wear a mask because you may need care for something else besides COVID. And if you don't wear a mask, you may not be able to get that care because there may not be a bed available. I just want to finish by talking a little bit more about the vaccine because it's normal to have questions about a vaccine and especially about a new vaccine. I want you to know these vaccines are not only highly <coughs> effective, but they are incredibly safe. The average vaccine trial has about 5,000 people in it. These trials have had 30 to 60,000 people enrolled in them, and we have over six candidates. That means we will have more data on the safety of these vaccines at the point of administering them to people than we've had for any other vaccine in history. I want you to also know that the way we develop these vaccines is through platform technology. And, and here's what that means. If you're playing a video game, and I've got two teenage boys at home who play way too many video games, uh, you don't throw away the uh, PlayStation 
or the Xbox when you want to play a new game, you simply change the cartridge out. And 95% of the work is already done for you in terms of having that new game in that console that you have in that platform. The platform that we're using for these vaccines has been around for over a decade. We know it's safe because this platform has been used for other vaccines and for tens of thousands of other people across the globe. We simply changed out the cartridge to adapt it to COVID. So not only do we have 30 to 60,000 people in COVID specific trials to prove the safety of these vaccines, but we have over a decade of evidence showing that these platforms are safe. We also haven't cut a single safety corner. In addition to the platform technology, we've achieved efficiencies through getting rid of bureaucratic delays. Usually, if you got to a stage uh, where you needed a review, you'd send in your information and it would sit on a desk somewhere in Washington, D.C. for six weeks or sometimes six months. We expedited the review of these different stages so that we could move along the process more quickly. And we also invested hundreds of millions of dollars in manufacturing so that we could start producing vaccines before there was ever one authorized. Uh, that allows us to more quickly deploy these vaccines when one actually makes it across the finish line uh, through taking on that financial risk and the knowledge that we may have to throw away hundreds of millions of dollars of one vaccine, but we will be able to more quickly deploy another vaccine. I want to finish just by helping you understand I'm optimistic, even though these are dark times. I'm optimistic because in less than a year, we have more than one vaccine that is likely to make it across the finish line. More than one vaccine that is greater than 90% effective. More than one vaccine that I am confident is safe, and I'm so confident that as soon as they tell me to get the vaccine, I will get the vaccine on national TV. I feel it is safe. I feel it is effective. I feel it will help us in this pandemic. But guess what? It's not about the vaccination or the vaccine alone. It's about who gets vaccinated. And we need each and every one of you to be willing to get vaccinated when the time comes. But we also need you to take measures in the meantime. Uh, another important point that the governor wanted me to mention, and I, I want to throw this in, is that we will likely have to continue mitigation efforts uh, through the uh, middle of next year. And that's regardless of whether you get vaccinated or not. When we evaluate these vaccines, we actually evaluate them to determine whether or not once someone gets infected, whether or not they end up in the hospital or has serious complications and die. That's what we're evaluating. Having a vaccine does not mean that you cannot get infected. It means that if you get infected, you are less likely to have complications and that hopefully you're less likely to spread the virus to other people. So we will still need to practice precautions even as people get vaccinated. But, but as we vaccinate the vulnerable and our healthcare workers, we'll be able to open more places because we know the virus won't spread as much and people won't be as likely to die. We'll be able to get back to a greater sense of normalcy and that can happen very quickly if we all do our part. So please, be concerned about these rising case numbers. It's gonna be a hard, a hard next three to four weeks because it takes about three to four weeks for cases that are diagnosed today to move through the system. So we know that no matter what we do, it's gonna be hard, but we can all do our part to preserve capacity by being cautious, and then we should have the confidence that a safe and effective vaccine is coming for all of us and that we can end this pandemic and get back to normal early next year, start to get back to normal and get back to the way things used to be, hopefully around the summertime, but that's only if you all do your part. So thank you for having me here today. Have hope, but understand you're not helpless right now uh, while you're waiting for that hope to become reality in the form of a vaccine. And the governor and I are happy to take questions if you have any. If you, uh, thanks Dr. Adam, yeah.
questions for the Surgeon General or myself, if you have a question, press pound five. You'll be notified that your hand is raised. Um, you can ask your question. If the question's already been answered, press pound five again. First phone question. Hi, thank you, Governor and uh, Surgeon General Adams. This is Marie Giorgio with NBC Montana, and I have two questions, please. Uh, the first is for the Surgeon General. I'm wondering, uh, do you think that hospitals should require employees to get the vaccine? So I want people to, to really understand the history of vaccine requirements. Uh, there's a high threshold for requiring someone to get a vaccine, especially a vaccine that has just been authorized. Um, we require, in many cases, people to get vaccines before they go to school because they can put other people in danger uh, if you don't get vaccinated. Uh, we also require healthcare workers to get vaccinated against the flu and against um, uh, pertussis, for instance, so that you don't put your patients at risk. Uh, it's going to be up to hospitals to decide and workplaces to decide uh, how strongly they will encourage the COVID vaccination. But what I want people to know is that whether it's required or not, you should be raising your hand and saying, I want to get vaccinated because that's going to allow you to, to more freely go about your business. That's going to allow us to open more places. That's going to allow us to save more lives. So I'm not ducking your question here. Um, it's ultimately going to be up to the individual hospitals and businesses to decide. I actually think very few places will ultimately require it at this stage. But I do want people to really think long and hard about refusing a vaccine that is 90% effective, that's safe, and that helps us end this terrible pandemic. One of the reasons we've had people uh, really lose appreciation for vaccines over the years is because almost none of your viewers or listeners have met someone who's been hospitalized because of smallpox or died because of measles. Uh, many people don't see the benefits of vaccines the way that we did 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago. Well, guess what? You're going to see the benefit of this vaccine, and it's going to be very real to you and to your communities. So get it because it's the right thing to do, not because someone else tells you you have to do it. Just like wearing a mask. Wear it because it's the right thing to do for you and your family and your community, even if you're opposed to doing it because someone says that you have to do it. Because guess what? It's going to benefit you to do so. Thank you, Dr. Adams. And my next question is, um, I'm wondering what, I know hindsight is 2020, but what should the federal government have done differently to manage this virus from the beginning? So the question is, what should we or could we have done differently? And uh, it's always challenging to, to look backwards. Uh, I can only speak for myself. And one of the things that I wish I had done a better job of, and I say this to the people of Montana, is communicating the uncertainty around this virus. Uh, I want you to understand that your public health workers, your scientists, your doctors have been working hard and they've been following the scientific process. They've been telling you the, what to do and, and giving the best advice they could based on what they knew at the time. And again, I use masks as an example. Uh, but that said, this virus has been incredibly tricky. It's the reason we have a once in a century pandemic. And when the information has changed, we have changed our recommendations. But people think that doctors and science is infallible. Uh, that's not the idea behind science. Science is about making the best recommendations you can based on the best information you have today, but then having the humility and the vigilance to keep looking. And if the information changes, then you change your recommendations. I don't think that, that I or we did a good enough job of explaining to the public, hey, we're just learning about this virus, and this is what we think is the right thing right now, but that may not be the case a week from now, a month from now, six months from now. And I think that that really hurt the confidence that people have in some of the recommendations that we put out there. And that's why I'm really taking the time now to unpack this and to help you all understand 
how our knowledge about the virus has changed, and why we now are confident that masks work. Uh, that's why I took the time to unpack the vaccine process and help people understand how the vaccine was developed uh, seemingly so quickly, even though it really has been developed over a decade, and why I feel that it is safe and effective. And I will continue to help people understand that we're learning every single day, and we will continue to be honest with you, to give you the best information that we can based on what we know right now. And what we know right now is Montana's positivity rates are coming down because of the great work of the people of this state. And we want you to use that knowledge to continue to protect yourselves until we get to a vaccine. Next final question. Hi there, this is Catherine Houghton with Kaiser Health News. Thanks for the time. Um, this question is both for Governor Bullock and Surgeon General Adams. I've heard from people who work with adults with disabilities who are concerned that their clients may be left behind when it comes to access to the vaccine. Um, from the latest information I've seen, and I think this is both for Montana and CDC guidelines, um, scroll down and see that real quick, but it looks like people who live in adult care facilities are a priority when it comes to the first phase of the distribution plan. I'm wondering, though, does that include people who live with disabilities in group homes? And if not, where does that population fall on the list of priorities for, for accessing a vaccine? I'll have uh, Catherine. Uh, Jim Murphy, the head of the Infec Infectious Disease Bureau, directly address what where it lands in Montana right now. And I'll frame it from the 80,000 foot level. Uh, we really want to immunize for impact. That is our mantra from a federal perspective. And we know that who you immunize first, second, third in Montana is likely to be different from who you immunize first, second, third in New York City or in Dallas, Texas. And that is because you have different demographics. You have different challenges. Uh, one of the things that we talked about with the governor's team earlier is the fact that the Pfizer vaccine has to be kept uh, in cold storage down to minus 70 degrees Celsius. So what does that mean for making vaccines available to remote parts of Montana? Um, but overall, uh, we want the states to think through who is going to be most impacted by a vaccination, who's being most impacted by the virus right now, and then make decisions about allocation. Uh, regardless of when you get vaccinated, it is still important to remember mitigation effort, uh, measures. We want to protect people. When you look at some of these other countries around the world that don't have a vaccine, but yet still have very low transmission rates, the lesson is that you can stop this disease without a vaccine. You can stop it with public health measures. The three W's, wearing a mask, washing your hands, and watching your distance. So we will work as hard as we can to get everyone who wants a vaccination vaccinated as quickly as we can. And we're really excited about 20 million people vaccinated in December, followed by the potential for 30 million people to be vaccinated in January, and another 50 million people to be vaccinated in February. And that's not even counting if Johnson & Johnson and AstraZeneca get approved. But that said, in the meantime, we've all still got to be vigilant and protect those individuals who aren't yet able to get vaccinated for whatever reason. And that may be because they're uh, not in a top tier or because they aren't um, the people who are most at risk in a particular state, or it may be because they're a pregnant woman or a child who's under 18. Remember, the vaccine hasn't been approved for children under 18. We've still got some work to do, but the finish line is in sight. And I'll turn it over to the state yeah. to talk about the plan. And and just to, just to clarify, I really appreciate that answer, but I'm wondering specifically if looking at the phrasing of people who live in adult care facilities being in that kind of priority for first phase of the distribution plan, I'm wondering specifically, do people with developmental disabilities who live in group homes, are, are they a part of that category? Yeah, so this is Jim Murphy. I'll take a, a stab at answering that. So. A lot of the priorities are difficult to set and it comes down to vaccine supply issues. The ACIP or the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices has identified the first target populations and as you say, it talks about frontline healthcare workers, uh, essential healthcare personnel, 
And then it gets into um, these group settings, starting with long-term care and assisted living facilities. The vaccine supply is enough, the first round of vaccine supply is enough to do those priority populations. We're hoping that ACIP recommendations that come out uh, hopefully today or tomorrow will further delineate the next group, which makes perfect sense that it will include um, those folks in you know, other settings, congregate settings, such as adult group homes. If you look at the dramatic impact on fatalities in Montana and hospitalizations in Montana, a lot of that was driven by our long-term care centers and our assisted living facilities. We've had less of an impact in the group homes, uh, which we've been very fortunate, but it is a priority population for us. And as vaccine supply allows, any vaccine supply that is not used up on the first wave of vaccinations will be going to um, hopefully essential workers and also folks in those congregate settings that you described. So they are a high priority. It's just a limitation of vaccine supplies uh, that we're going to have available during the month of December. Paul? Yeah. Uh, my question's for the Surgeon General, actually. Um, I'm wondering, in Montana, some of the debate over masking has spilled into the State House over the last couple weeks with our state legislature. They've held meetings here with some people. One day we had about 100 lawmakers here in person unmasked in meeting. They've been meeting this over the last week and will decide soon how they're going to hold the session, whether it's going to be in person some sort of hybrid or entirely remote. There's also been suggestion of trying to delay. Sort of have a three-part question around that for you. I'm wondering if you were to talk to the lawmakers, what would you suggest to them as being the best avenue to hold the session? Would it be, could you do it safely? Could you do it remote? Would you delay? And then I wanted to ask too, you, know, you talk a lot about the work you've done to encourage the use of masks and distancing and all those measures what something like that means. You know, Montanans can watch our legislature meet to have a bunch of people meeting massless and that being broadcast you know, on televisions and screens across the state, what that does to the message. And then also, you know, we had one falsehood already about the science behind masks, which you, you know, clearly explained how they work, said on our House floor in one of those very public meetings. You're know, wondering what that does to the messages that people like you and others are trying to share with the public. Well, I am, a Christian, and with apologi apologies to those who, who, who aren't, this is not meant to, to push my religion on anyone, but I, I really do believe we need to show everyone out there a little bit of grace. And there are a lot of people who simply are asking questions based on some of the confusion that is out there around a lot of these topics. Uh, there are a lot of people out there who uh, don't know the latest information on mask wearing or who have received misinformation from other people. And part of showing grace also is caring for your fellow man and realizing when you have an opportunity to protect your fellow man, uh, either directly through a person-to-person -person engagement or through the example that you set. So here's the way I would approach a skeptical person, whether it was a legislator or anyone else. I would genuinely sit down and ask them, what is your concern about mask wearing? Is it that you don't believe that they work? And then if that is the case, then I would walk through why they work. And I did that earlier, so I won't take up your time doing that. But the science is clear that masks work to limit the spread of disease. And if Wearing a mask even works 10%, and we feel like it works much more than that, but if it's even 10% and you can save a life, then why not do it? Um, some people are worried about carbon dioxide and, 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 and rebreathing that, and I hate to even repeat some of these myths, but I know that that's a common one. I am an anesthesiologist. I have worn a mask for most hours of the day for most of my adult life. If Rebreathing carbon dioxide through a mask was a danger. You would have millions of brain damaged surgeons and nurses all across the, the globe. It is just factually incorrect to think that you are going to rebreathe a significant amount of carbon dioxide by wearing a mask and it is going to cause you harm. So, there is a clear benefit in this pandemic to wearing a mask 
physically, economically, to your neighbor, and to yourself. And there is very, very, very little downside. So as Surgeon General of the United States, I would say to anyone who is asking me that I genuinely believe that the science is clear that the benefit of wearing a mask right now significantly outweighs the risk and that we show that we care for our community and each other by wearing a mask and that I hope that you will do so and that you will ask me or ask a public health official or a scientist if you have further questions about this. But as leaders, uh, I really do think that especially at this critical time as we see cases go up, you don't want to be the reason that a woman in labor can't get a hospital bed. You don't want to be the reason a person who gets in a car accident in a snowstorm can't get an ICU bed. And it's just for a little bit longer. It's just for a little bit longer until we can get enough people vaccinated to get herd immunity and really protect our vulnerable and suppress this virus. So just hang in there, understand the science about this, this virus has evolved, but it's strongly in support of mask wearing and do your part to protect your communities. That's what I would say to someone. Thank you. My question is for the Surgeon General as well, Dr. Well, Adam. You know, <laughs> they see me every week. It's, it, it's not, the, not, not the personal, Governor Bullock, you know that. Uh, Dr. Adams, my question for you is you've obviously been around the country. You've seen different surges like you mentioned. I'm just wondering, since you've arrived here in Montana, how does Montana compare to other states when it comes to containing the coronavirus? Well, there, there are things that are the same, and then there are things that stick out. Uh, as I mentioned, this surge is hitting everywhere at the same time. So in many cases, Montana is not unique in seeing cases and hospitalizations rise. Uh, one of the things that I really appreciated from my conversation with the hospitals this morning is that they meet every single morning. They're talking about capacity proactively. They're talking about staffing. I was actually, uh, and I want the people of Montana to know this, I was uh, very concerned to hear that there are well over 100, closer to 200 healthcare workers in the state today who were either in isolation or quarantine for COVID-19. That's 200, almost 200 health workers who aren't available to take care of you if you have a problem. Uh, that is why we're concerned about capacity. Most hospitals are near or above 100% capacity, meaning there's no room in the end. That is why I'm concerned. Uh, but I also think that there's good news. The good news is, again, that Montanans are moving their numbers in the right direction. So I want you to be encouraged. I want you to stay the course. Uh, there's some ominous signs, but there's also some good news about people doing the right thing. So continue to do the right thing. We'll get to a vaccine. We'll get through this together. And just to follow up on that, sir, the Pfizer vaccine, the initial reports out of the United Kingdom are that some folks who have taken it have seen allergic reactions to the Pfizer vaccine. To your knowledge, have you seen anything with studies related to the vaccine that people should be aware of instances like that? We have seen studies uh, for all of the vaccines. I've reviewed the Pfizer data that's publicly available myself. And I want people to know that you can have an allergic, allergic reaction to a peanut. You can have an allergic reaction to milk. You can have an allergic reaction to anything, and when you start exposing large numbers of people to anything, anything at all, you are going to see a certain number of people have a reaction to it. Here's what people should know. The vaccine has been shown to be safe in, hundreds, uh, in tens of thousands of people, um, and if you combine the trials, over 100,000 different people have been exposed to this type of technology. And whenever we administer any vaccine, the reason we do it in a pharmacy or a doctor's office is so that if you have a reaction, we can quickly recognize it and respond to it. So while it's getting a lot of press because of COVID and because of, the vac because of what's going on in the news, the reality is this is not something that's unexpected. It's not something that we are unprepared to deal with. And uh, people shouldn't let that um, uh, dissuade them from getting vaccinated uh, for the uh, for the virus, uh, and I will be getting vaccinated as soon as they tell me 
I am able to get vaccinated. So stay tuned, coming to your uh, local news station, uh, the Surgeon General getting his COVID vaccine as an example for everyone else. And I'd only add, look, two weeks ago at 20% positivity. It is a high, high number, 14% positivity for the amount of testing we're doing remains a high number. Um, you're seeing further increases all around the country. I mean, the moment of optimism after the last two weeks is our numbers now are no longer increasing, at least right now. They've actually decreased. And again, it's up to all of us, not just statewide requirements and limitations on crowd gatherings to do so. Oh, Jonathan. Thank you, Governor. Jonathan Amberry and Montana Television Network. Um, there was a lot of talk, uh, well, you and uh, Surgeon General Adams wants to weigh in as well. Um, there was a lot of talk a couple of weeks ago about uh, concerns about the effect that Thanksgiving might have on our um, cases, and it's two weeks on now, and as you say, it don't seem to be increasing a lot. I was wondering if you could give us an idea of what you see as the uh, effect, if any, that Thanksgiving's had on the COVID situation. Well, I think so far we have not seen a significant impact. Um, and hopefully, you know, and we are just about getting to that point. There was also, look, both the public awareness of the concerns of Thanksgiving, and that was also when we put in additional um, directives along the way. So. I don't think, whatever the case is, um, the message out of this event shouldn't be spike the football, <laughs> you know, things are good. Uh, what the message should be is that when we take this that much more seriously, when we're seeing continued increases in cases all around the country, that we can actually limit it. Can I jump Please, in on that yeah. too? Thank you. Uh, I, no, I, I think it's a great question, and it's one that we get often about the Thanksgiving surge. Here's what we know. After every major holiday this year, we have seen an uptick in cases relative to the baseline. We expect that to happen for Thanksgiving also. Here's something else that's changed about the science and the, uh, or in the, in the data and the transmission of the virus. Earlier on this year, it was largely older people being infected right away. And so you saw those cases turn into hospitalizations pretty quickly. Uh, what we're seeing now with transmission is that younger people are, are getting the virus and transmitting it asymptomatically. And that happens almost silently for a couple of weeks until Johnny goes and hangs out with grandma and gives it to her. So it can take now three to four weeks before you start to see the surge that will come from bad behaviors. And that is why we have to stay vigilant. The other thing to understand is that cases are going up on a high trajectory around the country. And it is hard to see a uh, stream forming within a raging river. <laughs> and so uh, it, it, it at times, uh, it was always gonna be difficult to see the impact of a Thanksgiving surge in the midst of high background transmission rates. But that said, again, I want to emphasize that, as the governor mentioned, a lot of people are doing the right thing. And you hear all the bad out there. You hear about the bad behaviors or the, or the misinformed behaviors. But the fact is, fewer people traveled this Thanksgiving by far than traveled last year. Um, many more people kept Thanksgiving within their household this year. And to them, I say thank you, because your efforts did make a difference Absolutely, they absolutely made a difference. And uh, so we will see a surge and many hospitals are saying they're seeing some of these Thanksgiving cases come in when you do the contact tracing and you find out where did these cases occur. But that surge is smaller than what it could have been because of the mitigation efforts of the people of Montana. And that's why we need to continue these through Christmas. Thank you. Governor Bullock, Megan Lewis with Montana right now. If the vaccine were available today, would you take it? If the vaccine were available today, I would not be a frontline healthcare worker. So from that perspective, no, I'd give it to the healthcare worker. If within sort of the distribution plan, I'd absolutely take it. 
Is there any change in the timeline as to when it will be available for the general public here in Montana? No, I, I mean, look, our anticipation is that by the end of this year, calendar year, by the end of December, there'll have been about 60,000 first time doses here. So it all depends on the continuing supplies. I mean, we'll get 9,750, um, presumably, assuming it's approved of the Pfizer vaccine. Next week, the following week, we'll get 16,000 Moderna and another 11,000. Um, is it 16,000 or 18,000? 18, 18,000 Moderna and another roughly 11,000 of the Pfizer. So we hope that this just continues along the way, but there's no insight, at least at the state level, uh, when it will be widely available for anybody that wants it. And if the vaccine were available for the governor today, the Surgeon General would give him it. Yeah, today. yeah, and, and I would take it. And, and I, I want to reiterate to people that um, there's something you can do right now to protect your communities, and that's get your flu shot. It is National Influenza Vaccination Week this week. There were 500,000 people who were hospitalized for the flu last year. 500,000. We cannot afford, we simply cannot afford, with hospital capacity nearing 100%, all around the nation to have 500,000 people hospitalized for the flu this year. Hundreds of millions of people have been, have been vaccinated against the flu over the uh, past several decades. We know it is safe. We know it is effective. So please, right now, get your flu vaccine so that you can preserve hospital capacity. And ask your questions when you go in to get your flu vaccine about the COVID vaccine so you feel comfortable getting that when it does become available to you. The uh, Surgeon General has a number of other commitments throughout the day before he goes to the Fort Peck Nation uh, tomorrow. So I'll be stopping here, but again, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Adams, for joining us.